Well, good evening and let's get right to breaking news at five and a 14 year old girl hit by a car in Brush Prairie near Prairie High School. Washington State Patrol say she was crossing State Route 503 around 2.30 this afternoon, but not in a crosswalk. Authorities say traffic in one southbound lane had slowed for her, but the teenager stepped out in front of a car in a second lane. The teen suffering non-life threatening injuries and was taken to the hospital. Police say the driver stayed at the scene and is cooperating. Now to our other big story tonight, a piece of Portland history disappearing right before our eyes. Today, crews began demolishing the old Portland Korean Church in downtown Portland. Hello, I'm Laurel Porter. And I'm David Molko. Authorities say the building was deliberately set on fire earlier this week, making it so unsafe there was no other option. Let's bring in Mike Benner now at Southwest 10th and Clay. Mike, how is the work going so far? You know, David, I'm no demolition expert, but I think it's going well. They've actually brought out some lights to uh, continue the work into the evening. And a couple of things got us to this point. You might recall that there was a fire here in September 2020, and at that point, officials deemed the building unsafe. And then there was a fire earlier this week, and the decision was made to knock down the building. In downtown Portland Friday, a demolition crew began the methodical task of bringing down the old Portland Korean church. Watching in the crowd of dozens was Wendy Rahm. So we want some of anything that we can get off of that, the tower. Rahm is hoping to preserve historical pieces of the building that sits at the corner of Southwest Clay and 10. The cornerstone uh, should be salvageable. Um, we're hoping that the weather vane could be salvageable. The building as a whole is not due to a three alarm fire Tuesday night. Just look at this video of flames tearing through the old church. Unbelievable work on the part of the people that, that arrived. Rick Graves of Portland Fire and Rescue is referring to the firefighters' efforts to save the house just to the east of the old church. They made entry into the home and they were fighting the fire at the church through an elevated position through the home's window. An incredible feat to stop a blaze investigators say was intentionally set. The alleged arsonist identified as Nicolette Store, seen here in court. The 25-year-old, who identifies as a woman, told detectives she heard voices saying she'd be mutilated if she didn't torch the church. Store, who claims to suffer from schizophrenia, also reported taking 10 oxycodone pills before starting the fire. Tragically, we have a community of folks that um, are actively using substances that are causing a lot of harm. Dr. Andy Mendenhall of Central City Concern is not directly connected to the case, but says Storer appears to be an individual struggling with both substance abuse and mental illness. What we now know is that there has been an insufficient system of care to meet the needs in the Portland metropolitan region and beyond of folks with substance use disorder and of folks with severe mental illness. And a result of that is the fire at the old Portland Korean church, demolished Friday before a crowd of onlookers who hope its history can be preserved. It's really an important church. All right, back out here live, still plenty of work to do, still plenty of cleanup to do, so the fences and the barricades will remain up. The streets in this area will be closed, so you'll want to keep that in mind if you're driving in downtown Portland this weekend. Let's send it back to you. Well, kudos to the fire crews who work so hard. I'm, glad, I'm really glad they're going to be able to save some of those historical pieces of the church. Thank you, Mike. Today marks two years since a violent mob stormed the U.S. Capitol. Federal prosecutors are still working their way through hundreds of cases. In all, more than 900 people have been arrested for the January 6th attack, including several people from Oregon and Southwest Washington. Our investigative reporter Kylie Boshi has been keeping tabs on all those local cases. Kyle, where do things stand right now? Laura, of the nine cases involving local defendants, only two have ended in guilty pleas. The other seven cases are still working their way through the legal system. In the two years since a mob of Donald Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol, the FBI and Justice Department have arrested more than 900 people, including nine suspects from Oregon and Southwest Washington. Most recently, federal agents arrested Lilla Sayer in July. Social media sleuths helped identify the Portland woman inside the Capitol during the insurrection. Court documents suggest Sayer was a believer in the QAnon conspiracy. Investigators were able to confirm Sayer's identity 
through public records and previous appearances, including this 2019 protest outside of Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler's house. She's wearing the red hat. Sayre is awaiting federal trial, as is Reed Christensen of Hillsborough, who's facing various charges after allegedly striking and pushing officers. Mark Brew of Vancouver is also facing federal charges, along with brothers Matthew and Jonathan Peter Klein and Richard Harris. Jeffrey Hubbard of Lincoln City pleaded guilty in November to one count of parading, demonstrating, or picketing in a Capitol building. He'll be sentenced in February. Jeremy Grace of Battleground also pleaded guilty to a federal charge for his role in the January 6th attack. In July, he was sentenced to 21 days in jail. Meanwhile, his father, Jeffrey Grace, is still awaiting his trial. Federal prosecutors say the father-son duo posed for photos together inside the Capitol during the insurrection. Heading into the third year of this investigation, the FBI still has a lot of work to do. Federal agents are still trying to identify roughly 350 people who were involved in the January 6th attack, including more than 250 wanted for assaulting police officers. Thank you, Kyle. Two children are home safe tonight after a Portland police officer found them driving a stolen car early this morning. At about 1.15 a.m., an officer saw two cars speed out of a fast food parking lot. The officer figured out one of those cars was stolen and stopped it near North Kirby Avenue and North Rosa Parks Way. Inside the car was a 10-year-old driver and 13-year-old passenger. The juveniles were taken back to their guardians and the stolen car was given back to its owner. Also new this evening, Portland police have arrested a juvenile suspect accused of shooting at two teenagers. This is a picture of the gun. Authorities say the suspect fired in the Argate Terrace neighborhood back on November 18th. Police say they found it inside a stolen vehicle a few days after that. The update here, police arrested the alleged shooter last night at the airport. He is now facing attempted murder charges. A 15-year-old boy suffered critical injuries. A 14-year-old girl was physically okay. Arrested for allegedly sexting a student. A female teacher at Mountain View High School in Vancouver appeared in court today. And we learned she's now facing a second charge. Police are also looking for more potential victims. Daisy Caballero has been following this case for us today. Daisy. Yeah, Laura, her name is Shelly Leatherwood, and according to Mountain View High's website, she's an animal science teacher. According to Vancouver Police, the 17-year-old student Leatherwood was allegedly sexting, was the one who reported this to another teacher. The school found out about this on Tuesday and placed Leatherwood on administrative leave. Police say the 45-year-old was arrested yesterday by the detectives from the Vancouver Police Department Digital Evidence Cybercrime Unit. Leatherwood was then booked into the Clark County Jail. We have Shelly Leatherwood on the line? Yes. This is video from Leatherwood's court appearance on Friday. She allegedly sent a nude photo of herself along with sexually suggestive texts. In an email sent to Mountain View High School parents, Principal Charles Anthony said in part, quote, We wanted to make you aware that a staff member was arrested today based on alleged inappropriate conduct with a minor. We know this news is disturbing for our students families, and staff members. We also know that you might have specific questions. Due to the fact that this is an ongoing police investigation and a personnel matter, we can't share specifics, end quote. Now, I also reached out to Washington's Professional Educator Standards Boards to find out what could happen to a teacher when they're being accused of something like this, including sexual misconduct. The director of communication tells me, generally speaking, if the district were to launch an investigation with the Office of Professional Practices and found sexual misconduct, then it is possible for a teacher to lose their license. 